Well, hi everyone. Uh, another lecture. Hopefully, um, things are going okay wherever you are, home or um, still here on campus. I know lots of rapid changes all the time and you know, a little hard to get used to, but we're going to continue on. This weekend, what I will do is I'll put a couple of assignments online for you to complete. And those will count towards your second test grade. Given that we are going all online now, um, what I would like to propose is that rather than have the next two tests, I just give you a series of you know, in-class assignments. You can work on them together however you want to do that. Actually, I suggest you don't get together. We're trying to social distance, right? Um, but I'm, I'm going to give you these. Uh, I'll put the first ones up this weekend and put a due date on that, and then we'll just try to continue. I'll try to get the material online to you in terms of the video recordings as best I can. And again, I apologize. I've been working on changing sound quality and so forth. Um, the only thing I don't worry about is whether or not you can see me up in the corner because probably distraction anyway, but I want you to know that I'm here. I'm giving these lectures. So we're going to move now into the Paleozoic. Um, since we finished the Ediacaran, um, and start working our way forward in time. There are major events that happen in the Paleozoic, and in terms of tectonics, this is the formation of Gondwana, the southern continents, a large uh, amalgamation of southern continents, the formation of Eurasia, which is the assembly of the northern continents, and of course the formation of the continent Pangaea towards the end of the Paleozoic. We also know in terms of life, there are several major extinctions during the Paleozoic. There's our extinctions in the Cambrian, in the Ordovician, the Devonian, and the Permian. And, and may or may not recall that the Permian extinction is by far the most deadly and widespread extinction in Earth history. It, sometimes nicknamed the day the Earth almost died. There are also a number of sea level changes that take place during the Paleozoic, and these are called um, the Sauk, and at least in North America, these are called the Sauk, the Tippecanoe, the Kaskaskia, and the Absarica. Sea level changes in the Cambrian were extremely high, in the Ordovician and Carboniferous sea levels were low. And these actually correspond very nicely to the climatic changes that we also see, the major climatic changes that we see in the Paleozoic. During the Ordovician and the Permal Carboniferous, we have glaciations, um, somewhat severe glaciations, not anything like the Snowball Earth episodes that we talked about. But there are climatic changes, there are major ice packs. And if you look above, you see that those Ordovician permocarboniferous glaciations correspond to sea level lows. And that's quite, it should be quite straightforward. The more ice you pack um, onto the continents and more ice, more water you remove from the oceans, the lower the sea level. The Cambrian, on the other hand, was an ultra greenhouse. So it was a time when there was very little, if any, glacial ice. And so sea levels were naturally. Um, quite high. We talk about how do we recognize this. So, you know, today we can talk, we can go out, we can measure sea level, we can do it on a daily basis, we can do it on a yearly basis. We can talk about how quickly sea level is rising, how quickly ice is melting. Can't really do that uh, as we go back in time because we have no no way, we have no recording devices back in the Cambrian to tell us what sea levels were other than the fact that we do have rocks. And certain rock types are associated with changes in sea level. And in particular, there are two sequences that we look for. And these are transgressive and regressive sequences in the rock record. Now, the actual process by which we see these in the rock record and we interpret in these in the rock record is a little bit more complex than I'm showing you here. But the basic idea is simple. We have two sequences, A and B. In sequence A, it is a transgressive sequence. If we look at the base of 
sequence A, we see is sandstone. So if you go out to the beach today, if, if during this break um, you're getting away from studies, you go out to the beach, see a lot of sand. Um, and so sandstone tends to be tends to form in areas where sea level is low. The beach is where sea level meets the land, so there's not really deep ocean there. As you get deeper, you would start to see um, things like shales being deposited, and the deepest sequence would be limestone. So this sequence um, from bottom of the section to top of the section where we see it moving from sandstone into shale into limestone without any time break. Okay, so this transgressive sequence would be one without a hiatus, without a gap in deposition. We go from sandstone to shale to limestone. Sea level at that particular location is getting deeper. If, on the other hand, we start at the bottom with limestone, and then we see shale and then sandstone, we are actually seeing a regressive sequence. Sequence B is telling us that sea level is getting lower. So it's important to keep these two, you know, these two sequences in mind: sandstone, shale, limestone. Transgressive sea level is rising at that location, and B that sea level is dropping at that location. Now. We can have sea level changes at a location due to either change, true changes in sea level, right? Sea level could be rising. We, there could be more water in the oceans, less ice. But it could also be possible that that area is being downdropped. Or the converse of that is that the area is being uplifted, right? If sea level changes, changes doesn't change at all, but you uplift that region, then you are going to see what appears to be a regressive sequence. That really sounds complicated, but what we want to do is find out where we can see a global signal for transgression and a global signal for regression. And that, is, that will then tell us what is happening with sea level rather than just a local event. And we do see these. We see these major sea level changes throughout the Paleozoic that are global in their extent. And here they are. This is um, you know, somewhat a view of, actually this goes all the way up through the Mesozoic. But if we just look at the Paleozoic, which ends here um, in the Permian, you can see we have this sock transgressive sequence. We have the Tippecanoe transgressive sequence, Kaskaskia, transgressive sequence, and then the Absarica um, transgressive sequence. So these are time intervals when sea level rose. So you can see here in the Cambrian, during the Sauk transgression, we have pretty high sea levels. And you can see as these kind of pyramids narrow, then we go into a regressive sequence. So here is the Ordovician. Uh, we have a transgressive sequence. We have a regression here at the end of the Ordovician. This is time interval in here where we have a glaciation. Then we have the Kaskaskia sequence here in the Absarica. And then you can see here in the uh, Permian and late Paleozoic, we have this major regressive sequence here, this white area, our regressive sequence. Then we see sea level rise again. So this is, although these are named in particular for North America, these reflect global sequences. These uh, Sauk, Tippecanoe, Kaskaskia, and Absarica sequences seen around the globe, they may be given different names. So this is a global signal. that. We if we turn our attention now to the Cambrian period, um, just give you a little history of how geologic periods are named. Um, the Cambrian system was named by Adam Sedgwick, who was a geologist in England for some rocks, which he called transitional rocks and whales that are found that were found below uh, Murchison's Silurian system. So you're learning you're learning the geological time scale, right? I ask you to know the geological time scale. It's important to understand how that geological time scale was developed. Let me have coffee because it's morning for me. 
and it wasn't made all in one go. It just didn't say, okay, let's start the Precambrian, then we'll go into the Cambrian, then we'll go to the Ordovician, then we'll go to the Silurian. Actually, these these intervals of time, these periods, and why they have such strange boundaries, um, at least in part, have to do with how they were named. And the Silurian period, or the Silurian system, as it was called when it was developed, actually was named prior to the Cambrian. There was no Cambrian. There was just the Silurian system. And then Adam Sedgwick said, well, look, there." Actually, if we if we look at these Silurian rocks that Murchison claims, we see these Silurian rocks, and then down below them we can see Precambrian rocks. But it looks like there is something in between the Precambrian and the Silurian. So he named those transitional rocks between the Precambrian and the Silurian. He called them the Cambrian. Now, there wasn't an Ordovician yet either, <laughs> so you know it's kind of weird how these things were. Or name. Um, when Sedgwick called these rocks the Cambrian, he didn't really recognize any fossils. It was based solely on the fact um, that there was this lithological change from what was thought to be Precambrian and what was known then to be Silurian. And then later in the 1950s, about 15 years later or so, then there's some fossils were discovered in the location that he called the Cambrian. Um, and in the mid 1800s, when the time scale was being developed, fossils were viewed as essential for naming and recognizing these systems. So even though Sedgwick called it the Cambrian, it really wasn't accepted because he had no fossil record on which you could base this classification system. So like I say, the, the, the naming of these geological periods is quite dynamic and quite weird um, in that they didn't come one right after the other. Um, recognize them. And it wasn't really until 1879 when a guy by the name of Charles Lapworth um, established the Ordovician, so we got Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian. So in 1879, 40-some years later, the Ordovician was discovered, the Ordovician was named, and then they said, okay, well, we've got the Silurian, we have the Ordovician defined by these fossils, and then we have these Cambrian we have these other rocks that Sedgwick called the Cambrian have different fossils. And so then by 1879, by that point, we then had the Cambrian, the Ordovician, and the Silurian. And Cambria, the, the reason it's called Cambria, Cambria is a region in Wales, in, in England, and that's where these rocks were discovered. And so that's how I got the name Cambrian. Some of the major events in the Cambrian, um, some we've talked about, some that we haven't. And of course, the biggest one is the rise of the animals. And this is the Cambrian expansion or Cambrian explosion that took place during the Tamadian. So if you recall from last lecture, the Tamadian is about 528 to 530 million years ago. So about 11. 11 to 12 million years after the Cambrian started, we begin to see this rise of animals, we see this rich diversity in the fossil record. Included in that rich diversity are these just fantastic sites of preservation. And these are called lagerstata. And lagerstata just means a exquisite fossil preservation. And these are known as the Burgess Shale, which is probably the the best known, um, there's a similar sequence in Sirius Passet in Greenland. There are the Chengjiang uh, fauna in China and the Qingjiang fauna in China as well. So there are these places where we can see just fantastic preservation of the Cambrian seafloor. And it's, it's great because we can get some idea of the ecology, we can get some idea of how these animals behaved, you know, who was eating who and so forth. So it, it's really nice to have these logger sort of fossils. Nearly every metazoan phyla began in the Cambrian. So if you go outside and you look at any living organism that you see, just about any living organism that you see on the planet today had its origins in the Cambrian. Now, they may have had ancestors that went a little deeper in time, 
but in the Cambrian we can find ancient relatives of just about every modern phyla in the Cambrian record. We also discussed this a little bit. This is the time interval in Earth history when we started to see the development of hard parts, things like phosphatic, calcitic, and chitinous skeletons. A, uh, calcitic things are like seashells. Chitinous skeletons are skeletons found in trilobites or roaches today. Modern roaches are, have chitinous skeletons. And then phosphatic skeletons are just instead of um, calcium carbonate, we have a, a calcium phosphate or phosphatic shells. Um, I mentioned some of the major tectonic events. It was during the Cambrian that Gondwana formed the supercontinent, and it actually wasn't a supercontinent, let's call it a supercraton, a very large continental landmass, Gondwana form. And the climate during the Cambrian, at least during the, the early uh, and to middle Cambrian, and even into the late Cambrian, the climate was moderate um, and warm due to continental location. Most of the continents were located on the equator. There appears to be little or no ice at the poles, and the North America was covered by these epiric seas. If we look at some of these uh, fossil logger strata in the in the Paleozoic, um, we can see some of these really nicely preserved um, fossils from uh, some of these logger strata. Here we can see uh, polyps, our coral polyps. Um, here, over here, we can see some worms and some things that look, this looks very similar to modern shrimp. And people create these dioramas of, of what the sea floor look like. So the preservation during this, this interval, especially in those loggers that I mentioned, we, we get exquisite detail both into the body plans and also with the trace fossils, we get some idea of how the organisms behave. I mentioned just a bit ago that North America was covered with epiric seas. Epiric seas or epicontinental seas represent shallow ocean bodies resulting from the flooding of continental interiors. And they are differentiated from the flooded margins, uh, continental margins of ocean basins. Those are called shelf seas in that they extend into the center of the continents. So in North America, for example, the Sauk Sea covered the interior of North America, and it was about it was somewhere less than 200 meters deep. But if you went into areas like Kansas or Michigan or Illinois, you would find back in the Cambrian, you would find that that was covered by shallow epiric seas. And so that's a difference because right at the continental margin. So for example, at at the, at the continental margin here in Florida, we do have a shell, we have a sea covering parts of Florida, but that is different. That is a shelf sea, and a pyrrhic sea would extend into the continental interior. And so this is kind of a map of the globe um, during the Cambrian, and you can see that much of North America was covered by these pyrrhic seas, and there was this arch here called the transcontinental arch which seemed to be a regional high back in the Cambrian that, that did stay out of the water. So we can, we can recognize this in the rock record. Um, the sock transgressive sequence um, is shown here, and it's kind of hard to see, but if you look, here is the background of the United States, Alaska here, Florida down here, and by the way, Florida was not here during the Cambrian, so um, we'll, we'll talk about when Florida joined us. It joined us um, during the formation and breakup of Pangaea. But that gives you an idea of geographically where we are. And you can see that out here, um, covering much of the southeastern United States and the eastern United States, was a carbonate bottom. So this is this is stock seafloor extended all the way up to uh, Michigan. Here's Michigan here. This was kind of a sandy sh seashore. And then this transcontinental arch that extended down um, into Colorado, New Mexico, and then here's the Mexico-US border. So there was this high region in parts of North America. 
And then this ancient shield, the Canadian shield, this ancient part of North America, remained emergent um, during this period of sea level high. But you can see all the way around it, you can see sandy bottom, carbonate bottom, and then very deep, deep ocean surrounding that muddy bottom. So that's the SOC transgressive sequence in North America. Um, the lithologies in the SOC transition, it's a transgressive series of deposits that covered North America during the Cambrian and early Ordovician. Um, the major units reflect different environments, but in general, um, and we see progressive deepening of the seas with the sandstone at the bottom, shale in the middle, and limestone at the top. If you go out to the Grand Canyon, or if you've been out to the Grand Canyon, if you go down to the base of the canyon, the, the first unit you see in the Phanerozoic is the Tapit sandstone. That is the initial, that's the lowermost layer. And then on top of that, you will see the Bright Angel shale and then the Moave limestone. That is the transgressive sequence that so you can go out to the Grand Canyon. You can, you can go down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and walk up to that transgressive sequence that represents the sock. So here it is in a picture. Um, you can see the Precambrian basement here, overlain by the Tibet sandstone, then the Bright Angel shale, and then finally the Moave limestone. And these are lower to middle to upper Cambrian. So this is the sock transgressive sequence that we see in the Grand Canyon. The tectonic setting of the Cambrian, we have a few things happening, um, most notably, is that Gondwana forms, and Gondwana is made up of Africa, South America, Madagascar, India, Antarctica, Australia, and the Seychelles. And it forms at about 530. And when I say it forms at 530, that's when they were all united. Different pieces came together at different times. I'll show you a map of that in just a second. Um, Laurentia, or North America, was located near the equator during the Cambrian. The Iapetus Ocean, which is the forerunner to the Atlantic Ocean, um, has already opened and started to close at this time. Um, if you know anything about mythology, you know that Iapetus was the, was the father of Atlas. Atlas is the Atlantic Ocean, so Iapetus is the forerunner of the Atlantic Ocean. And Siberia was also located um, near the equator at that time. If we look at formation of Gondwana in the southern hemisphere and the opening of the Iapetus Ocean, we can, we can kind of you can look at this. Um, these are all named oceans um, within either the Cambrian or later, and you can see um, that Iapetus, Climene, Oceanus, and Tethys, and then Atlas Ocean here and Pleiades. This is kind of the, these are all ocean names that we see in the geologic record, including Atlas, which would be the Atlantic Ocean. The assembly of Gondwana, as I said, it took place, um, it was finally completed in the early Cambrian, but it actually was a polyphase assembly. And if you look at Gondwana, you can see these different blue areas here. These all make up western part of Gondwana, and the yellow here make up the piece of eastern Gondwana. And in between those, you can see these kind of different colors, squiggly lines, either red over here. These are green. Uh, you see some blue ones. These are the major mountain building events that form. These mountains formed as these different pieces came together. And if you look carefully, you'll see a sequence of blue orogenic events all over in western Gondwana, different areas of western Gondwana. Those are called the Brasilio Damara orogenic belts. If you look um, over here between these pieces of west Gondwana and these pieces of east Gondwana, you'll see this kind of reddish pink area here that is called the East African Orogenic Event. Origin just means mountain building. And then if you look here in the green, the green kind of goes in between India, Antarctica, down along here, and then continues a little bit into East Africa. That is called the Kuungan origin. And the Kuungan origin is the youngest of all of these. And the Kuunga is a uh, 
comes from the Swahili word kuunga, which means to unite. So the kuunga in origin is the mountain building event that led to the final assembly of the Gondwana uh, continent. Gondwana is sometimes referred to as Gondwana land, and it's derived from two words, Gond and Wana. The Gonds are a uh, were the, one of the largest tribal groups in the world and found throughout India. And Wana means land or land of, hence Gondwana means land of the Gonds. And the Gondwana, Gondwana sequence is a Permian-Triassic sequence of sedimentary rocks found in India. It's, it's found elsewhere. But that name Gondwana came from uh, came from India. West Gondwana is comprised of Africa and South America, whereas East Gondwana is comprised of India, Madagascar, Seychelles, Australia, uh, and Sri Lanka, and Antarctica. That should say it says Australia. It should be Antarctica. The simplest view. The very early view of how Gondwana assembled was simply that you had these East Gondwana blocks here, and you had these West Gondwana blocks here, and you had this big orogenic belt here that I call the East African origin, um, but was previously called the Mozambique Ocean. And the simple idea was that West Gondwana collided with East Gondwana along this Mozambique belt or Mozambique Ocean, and these two halves just came together um, in the Cambrian and formed Gondwana. The more we examine this, so this would be the Mozambique belt here, the more we looked at this in, in detail, um, the more we realized that that simplistic view um, didn't hold, and in fact, um, I will take some credit here because in 2003, um, I wrote the paper with this uh, figure that you see here and argued that the assembly of Gondwana was far more complicated than just a simple collision along the Mozambique belt. And I proposed that it actually did coalesce, that Gondwana coalesced through a series of orogenic events rather than just this simple merging. So we now understand the assembly of Gondwana much better today than we did back even 20 years ago. If we, if you're trying to go out and you're looking at rocks and um, you find a certain sequence of fossils in the record of rocks, there are four fossils that will trigger right away. You'll say these are Cambrian rocks. And if you see these four fossils occurring together, you can be pretty sure that you're looking at rocks that are Cambrian in age. And this is why fossils became so important to the naming of these different periods. So the four diagnostic fauna of Cambrian are trilobites, brachiopods, archaeocyathids, and echinoderm. You will not find those same four fossils in any younger rocks. They just don't occur. Archaeocyathids died out in the Cambrian. Trilobites became vastly diminished. Trilobites did exist all the way through the Paleozoic, but they were greatly diminished in size and diversity by the end of the Cambrian. So you see these four fossils together. Your best guess is these are Cambrian rocks. So what do they look like? Um, here's a trilobite. I think most people have seen um, trilobites. These are uh, brachiopods. Uh, and these are kind of bi they're typically bivalve. This one, I believe, is lingula. And this particular brachiopod has remained pretty much unchanged since the Cambrian. You can find it in modern sediments. But it was very abundant, much more abundant back in the Cambrian. These are archaeocyathids. You can see here's a penny for scale. These are the first reef-forming organisms. So just like we have reefs today, um, there were reefs in the shallow oceans of the Cambrian. But the types of reef-dwelling organisms were quite different. Even though the structure of the reef might have looked very similar, um, these are the archaeocyathids that made up large Cambrian uh, reefs. And then echinoderms. I think everyone is familiar with echinoderms, um, such as starfish. 
So you find these four fossils together in a rock, um, you're, you're safe. In fact, you can almost be 100% sure that you're looking at Cambrian age rocks. Now, in spite of the fact that there was this large Cambrian explosion, there were at least four major extinction that occurred during the, during the Cambrian. The first occurred um, in the early Cambrian epoch boundary, so very shortly after this, this rise. And the oldest group of trilobites called the Olenelids um, perished, as well as the primary reef building organisms, the Archaeocyathids. So Archaeocyathids, the big reef building organisms, went extinct during the early Cambrian. And the remaining three extinctions were irregularly distributed around the late Cambrian boundary and as a whole severely affected um, trilobites, brachiopods, and conodonts, another type of fossil that we haven't uh, talked about yet. But there were, this, there were these pulsed extinctions during the Cambrian. Most likely, uh, as far as we can tell, this is not due to any climate changes in the Cambrian. There might have been slight climate changes overall. It was a greenhouse. These are probably these are probably changes in the ecosystem as this you know, this first explosion of diversity formed on the planet, and then there was competition and rapid evolutionary changes. And some things were successful, and some things not. Following the Cambrian. Um, of course, is the Ordovician, and it's the second period of the Paleozoic era. This important period saw the origin and rapid evolution of many new types of invertebrate animals, which replace their Cambrian predecessors. The first primitive plants move onto land, which was until then totally barren or maybe covered with some sort of lichen type. Um, Organisms, but for the most part, if you went on land in the Cambrian or in the Precambrian, you wouldn't. There wasn't much to see. There were rocks there. Uh, the supercontinent of Gondwana, towards the end of the Ordovician, drifted over the South Pole, and that initiated a great ice age that gripped the Earth, and then led to the end of this period, the late Ordovician extinction. The name Ordovician, I mentioned it when we were talking about the Cambrian, the Ordovician system was proposed in 1879 by Charles Lapworth, um, and he established the Ordovician from studies in Wales and elsewhere based on graptolite fossils. And by this time, trilobites were already known from rocks below the, the classical Silurian and Sedgwick, Sedgwick, Sedgwick's Cambrian system. So the first one, the first period that was named, or system that was named, was the Silurian system. That was followed by the Cambrian system, which was ignored until Lapworth discovered the Ordovician system and named it um, for this region in Wales. Um, I should mention, too, I, I didn't put it on this slide, but the name Ordovician, so all of these periods have names um, that, that they relate to. The Ordovices. Um, were a Celtic tribe, and so the Ordovician system is named after this Ordovician, Ordovician uh, Celtic tribe. The major Ordovician events that we that happened, there was a major transgression in the Middle Ordovician, so a sea level rise in the Middle Ordovician. This was followed by a major regression in Late Ordovician related to the glaciations in the Gondwana continent. So as Gondwana drifted over the South Pole and became glaciated sea level drop. There was a major radiation following those Cambrian extinctions and the rise, most importantly, the rise of the cephalopods. So jokingly uh, refer to this as an intelligence increase in the Ordovician. So cephalopods are things like squids and uh, octopi, things like that. So things with larger brains. So there was an intelligence rise in the Ordovician. Looking at the paleogeography and Ordovician time, here is, these are two views of the globe. This is just a different map view of the early Ordovician. And North America here, here's that transcontinental arch extending through. This is Siberia, Baltica. Baltica is Northern Europe, much of Northern Europe, think Norway, Scandinavian countries and parts of Russia. 
And then Gondwana, you can see, is stretching here, um, pretty much from the equator all the way down to the pole. And here is the Iapetus Ocean, which is closing ahead of this arc called the uh, Taconic Arc. What's interesting about this? Well, there's a little piece down here. Um, it's never shown very well in these maps. But there is this little piece um, that, of crust that is situated between Africa and South America that uh, will later be Florida. So Florida was not attached to North America at this time. In terms of evolutionary events in the Ordovician, uh, we have mollusks, including the cephalopods. So in this time interval, even though these are related to octopus squid, the types of cephalopods were um, nautiloids and ammonites. So I'll show you pictures of nautiloids and ammonites that, that developed during the Ordovician. Um, and this was uh, associated with the rise, of course, of intelligence. Gastropods, things like snails, bivalves, clams. Um, crinoids, an incredibly rich variety of crinoids that are also known commonly as sea lilies. Bryozoans, which are moss animals. These are colonial type organisms that live, that help, were part of the reef structure. And then the corals, instead of having these archaeocyathid reefs, which aren't true corals, uh, we see the first early corals, and these are called rugose corals and tabulate corals. So a very different ecosystem. In the Ordovician, if you find these animals all in a sequence of rock, in particular with the crinoids, uh, and particularly these three, these these are all the reef organisms here, the rugose, tabulate corals, the bryozoans, crinoids, you find those in a rock sequence. Pretty good bet that you're looking at Ordovician rocks. What do they look like? Well, here's a crinoid. These are the, the sea lilies. These are the nautiloids. You can see these are straight cone nautiloids. They're called orthoceras. Um, ceres means horn. Ortho means straight. So these are the straight cone or straight um, horn nautiloids with organism coming out here. And these are the ammonites shown here. These bryozoans, um, another one of the reef dwelling organisms shown in that picture. Um, rugose corals look like this. Uh, they look like you know, typical corals, but they're, they are different from modern corals. And then tabulate corals, um, you can see, are layered through here like, like so. So these are the reef builders, the major reef builders during the Ordovician. And again, you see this assemblage, tabulate, rugose corals, crinoids, bryozoans, Nautiloids are a nice addition, but typically you see crinoids, bryozoans, rugose, and tabulate corals. Best bet, those are Ordovician rocks. In terms of tectonic events, um, we start to see some interesting developments that will lead ultimately to the formation of the Pangaea con supercontinent, and that is the beginning of the formation of the Appalachian mountain chain. And the orogeny, again, orogeny means mountain building event is called the Taconic. And the Taconic orogeny starts in the Ordovician. And this is a collision of small blocks of island arcs and microcontinents with northeast branches. So if you want to go to the you want to go find the Taconic orogeny, the best place to go look for the Taconic orogeny is in northeastern North America. So if you go up to places like um, Maine or Massachusetts or the or Canada up in the northeast part of North America, you will find evidence of the Taconic orogeny. It does extend all the way south, but much of that activity was located in northeastern North America. Um, here, if we look at a cross section from, you can see this is from Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, um, and Vermont. You can see that we have this carbonate shelf, and then we have this collision zone. You see everything's messed up in here. Um, and these are um, some of these microcontinents, these arcs, an island arc that collided with North America during the Ordovician and some of the uplifted Cambrian uh, and Precambrian basement. So a collision zone between these arcs and North America. And then you'll, we'll talk about this later in the Devonian. There is a second collision here that is called the Acadian orogeny that 
take place during this Lurian Devonian. But this is a taconic orogeny, and you can see that most of the collision here, the collisional zone here in New York, Vermont, and you can see similar stuff happening up in, in Northeast Canada as well. There was a major extinction associated with this glaciation in the late Ordovician. It occurred at the end of the Ordovician, sometime between uh, 440 and 450 million years, so Siluro um, Ordovician extinction. And this extinction is cited as the second most devastating extinction to marine communities in Earth history. So this is one of the big extinctions. Um, in Earth history, and it caused the disappearance of one, about one third of all brachiopod and bryozoan families, as well as numerous groups of conodonts, trilobites, and graptolites. Much of the reef building fauna was also decimated, and in total, more than 100 families of marine invertebrates perished during this extinction. So, we talk about the, the Permian extinction uh, being the day the Earth almost died. We, the, Cretaceous extinction, when the dinosaurs were wiped out, uh, the Cretaceous was big. It was not as big as the Ordovician extinction in terms of the, the number of families of marine fauna that perished during the Ordovician extinction. So this is a big one. Most people credit this extinction. It makes the most sense that this was due to the glaciation. Now, why does that, how did glaciation cause this extinction? Well, think about it. Most of these organisms lived in shallow ocean environments. If you begin to uh, decrease the amount of shallow oceans around the globe by locking up all that water into sea ice, then you lose a lot of those shallow reef communities. And remember, those shallow reef communities are the primary producers are all the higher consumers in the marine environment. And so when you wipe out those reefs, you wipe out the primary food source for much of most of anything else. So it's not surprising that a drop, a major drop in sea level, led to this major Ordovician extinction. So again, uh, this extinction has been theorized by most paleontologists to be the result of a single event, glaciation of the, con of the continent Gondwana uh, at the end of the Ordovician period. All right, um, that leads us into the Silurian, and the Silurian system was one of the first to be developed by Roderick Murchison for rocks with distinctive fossils that was originally classified as transitional, and that was a Wernerian term. So going back to the very beginning of class, remember there were two two competing sort of philosophies about the Earth. One were the Plutonists and one were the Neptunists. The Neptunists were led by this guy named Werner. And Werner had these, you know, these three rocks. They had these primitive, the transitional, and then the modern rocks. And so transitional, um, the Silurian system that Murchison discovered were originally classified as transitional um, in whales. and the Silurs, like the Ordovices, are an ancient Celtic tribe, so that's where the name Silurian came from. And Silurian was the generally accepted pre-Devonian system for the, all the layer, lower Paleozoic. Right? So Silurian was the first name to the lower Paleozoic. It was below the Devonian. The Devonian, we'll talk about it, has this classic old red sandstone. So the Silurian was everything that was lower Paleozoic, and younger than the Precambrian, and then the Ordovician and the, the Cambrian filled in after that. Uh, following the Gondwana glaciations, the Earth entered a greenhouse phase with generally equable climates from pole to equator. So in terms of a good time to be alive in Earth history, the Silurian was a great time to be alive, it really was. Um, the climate was good, biodiversity was good, um, the recovery from the Ordovician extinction was swift and efficient, led to a, a truly rich biodiversity, and the major evolutionary change in the Silurian, the big change that we see is a rich terrestrial ecosystem. Prior to this, pretty boring to be on land. Um, most everything was occurring um, in the ocean floor or in the marine environment. 
we have the development of major reef um, tracts of reef and evaporites. Evaporites are things like salts, big salt deposits. And in fact, if you, you know anything about salt, or even if you don't, the biggest one of the biggest salt mines um, in the United States sits beneath the city of Detroit. And much of Michigan, uh, much of the subsurface of Michigan, Ohio, and Illinois are these Silurian reef tracks. And because they're so rich in biodiversity, it turns out that these reef tracks are, are also excellent sources of petroleum deposits. So you shouldn't be surprised when you get up to Michigan, um, Ohio, parts of Ohio, and even Illinois, um, that there are oil wells up there and there's oil and gas exploration that occurs. And they're all, much of the source rock, the rich organic material that produces petroleum and gas comes from these um, Silurian reefs and associated deposits with the Silurian reef. They also form excellent um, reservoirs to host the petroleum. The uh, most important evolutionary development of this period was that of the first true terrestrial ecosystem, including um, vascular plants. Vascular plants just mean these are plants with tissue that can carry carries food to the rest of the plant. Um, they were mostly very simple. They didn't have really separate stems and leaves, but they, they did have an established vascularity that allowed them to connect with the surface and to pull up food and nutrients into the plant. Um, brachiopods are by far the most common hard shell organisms, um, making up about 80% of everything in the ocean. So if you want to identify a Silurian uh, deposit, if it's by and large full of brachiopods, then you're likely looking at Silurian rock. There are tropical reefs common in the shallow seas of this period um, with tabulate rugose corals, um, bryozoans, uh, there were trilobites, they were much smaller, but we had cephalopods, gastropods, and echinoderms. Uh, we also see the first jawless, jawless fish invading brackish and fresh water, as do ripterids, which are scorpion-like looking things, um, which may have been semi-aquatic. And at the end of the period, the jawed fish appear for the first time, but they're relatively insignificant. So we first, we see that development of a terrestrial ecosystem, and we start to see fish, as, um, at least a number of jawless fish invading the waters during the Silurian. Here are some typical Silurian fossil. Here are the Eurypterids. These are also known as sea scorpions, jawless fish such as Burkinia, crinoids, these funny uh, stem-shaped fossils, and then gastropods. Everybody knows a gastropod is a snail. So these are typical um, a typical Silurian fossil. In terms of tectonic events in the Silurian, the Iapetus Ocean flows during Middle Silurian time, and we had the Acadian orogeny, which was the collision between Baltica, again northern Europe with North America, and prior to the collision of Baltica with North America, we had Baltica uh, colliding with Avalonia to form Bologna. I love that name, Bologna and then the narrowing of the Tethian Ocean between Gondwana and Laurentia. So in the Silurian, the southern continents of Gondwana are beginning to drift towards the northern continents that are about to become Euro-America. So we're in the initial stages of the formation of Pangaea supercontinent. Here it is again shown in two different projections. This is the Silurian. This is North America here. This is Northern Europe, Baltica here. These are the Avalonian terrains. This is Siberia up here. And you can see the same thing here. Here's Siberia, North America, Baltica. And you can see this now this smaller ocean in between Gondwana and North America. So we're beginning to assemble the Pangaea supercontinent. The Acadian orogeny looking pretty much at the same cross section um, that we saw um, earlier, we can see Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Vermont, New Hampshire. Now they've added Maine to that. And here you can see the Taconic orogeny, the sort of ocean. This is now being you know, further deformed as these Avalonian terrains 
begin to collide during the Silurian with metamorphic rocks here, some granites and so forth. And then outboard of this will be the third major orogenic pulse that led to the formation of the Appalachian Mountains called the Alleghenian that takes place in the Permo, Permo Carbon effort. So we're assembling piece by piece the Pangaean supercontinent through three orogenic events. The Taconic, which has already happened, the Avalonian or Acadian orogeny, which uh, is Siluro-Devonian in age, and then finally um, we will get to the Alleghenian orogeny. Uh, looking at a little bit closer, we can see here development of the early Appalachian mountain chain. This is Baltica, so this is the Norwegian coast right along here, up into Greenland, and then coming down into the United States. Um, for reference, this is the northern part of North America, coming down along the east coast of North America. And these Avalonian terrains, these bits and pieces that broke off Gondwana are colliding with North America. In terms of extinction, like I said, Silurian is a great time to be around because there were no major Silurian extinctions, even though trilobites continued to decline um, in abundance during this interval. But there wasn't anything major extinction. Okay, I'm going to stop here um, for this lecture, and then we'll pick up with the Devonian um, in our next lecture.